Good evening. Our Lord does all things well. And among those things is his providence for us. He gives us good gifts. Not always what we desire, not always what we think is best for us, but even in giving us things that at times we might not want. Our Lord does all things well. We follow the order of common service this evening. We begin by singing our opening hymn, 343, Christ is the World's Light. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. 
Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. with you. Let us pray. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church. And because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our first scripture lesson this evening comes from Isaiah chapter 35, verses 4 through 7. Tell those who have a fearful heart, be strong, do not be afraid. Look, your God will come with vengeance. With God's own retribution, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unplugged. The crippled will leap like a deer, and the tongues of the mute will sing for joy. Waters will flow in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The burning sand will become a pool, and in the thirsty ground there will be springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. We join in singing Psalm 146. I'll sing the first half of each verse. The congregation will sing the second half. The congregation will also sing all the refrains and the gloria.
The second lesson, which is also the sermon text, is from James chapter 1, verses 17 through 27. Every good act of giving and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the lights, who does not change or shift like a shadow. Just as he planned, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits of his creations. Remember this, my dear brothers. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Certainly a man's anger does not bring about what is right before God. So after getting rid of all moral filthiness and overflowing wickedness, receive with humility the word planted in you. It is able to save your souls. Be people who do what the word says, not people who only hear it. Such people are deceiving themselves. In fact, if anyone hears the word and does not do what it says, he is like a man who carefully looks at his own natural face in the mirror. Indeed, he carefully looks at himself, then he goes away and immediately forgets what he looked like. But the one who looks carefully into the perfect law, the law of freedom, and continues to do so, since he does not hear and forget, but actually does what it says, that person will be blessed in what he does. If anyone considers himself to be religious, but deceives his own heart because he does not bridle his tongue, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled in the sight of God the Father is this, to take care of orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say, Rejoice. Alleluia. We rise for the reading of the gospel. The gospel for this week is Mark chapter 7, verses 31 through 37. Jesus left the region of Tyre again and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee, within the region of the Decapolis. They brought a man to him who was deaf and had a speech impediment. They pleaded with Jesus to place his hand on him. 
Jesus took him aside in private, away from the crowd. He put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. Then he looked up to heaven. After he, after he looked up to heaven, he sighed and said, Ephatha, which means be opened. Immediately the man's ears were opened, his tongue was set free, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus gave the people strict orders to tell no one, but the more he did so, the more they kept proclaiming it. They were amazed beyond measure and said, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. This is the Gospel of our Lord. We join to confess the Christian faith using the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for our hymn, Praise the Almighty, My Soul Adore Him.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Savior, Jesus Christ. God's word for our meditation this evening is our epistle lesson from James chapter 1. Your brothers and sisters, Christ. You've probably all heard it before. Many times, in fact. You heard it probably from your parents when you were little, from pastors, maybe from teachers. You hear it from your pastors still today in sermons and in devotions and in newsletter articles and in conversations. Need to listen to the word of God. You need to come to church and hear what God has to say. Hear God's word explained and preached. You need to, to read your Bible at home and have family devotions that you can grow together in the Word of God. You need to be in the Word of God. I don't apologize for that. I don't apologize for reminding God's people how important the Word of God is again and again and again. This evening, as we hear God's Word and His encouragement to hear His Word, it comes from an interesting place. Maybe not where you'd expect it. After all, the book of James is often known as a book that that focuses on Christian living. And this text as well. There's a lot of advice, a lot of commands, a lot of things we ought to do. Be, Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Talks about not just hearing the word, but but putting it into practice in your life. But at the heart and core of all of it, once again, we have this, this command from God, an encouragement from God to hear God's word. Because he explains why. Why is it so important to hear God's word? It's important because it's the means that God uses for giving his good gifts. And it is the power that he gives to us for our doing, for our living, for our serving. God does give gifts, doesn't he? In our gospel today, we hear that God does all things well, even the things that we might not want even the things that go differently than we would plan, our God is still doing all things well. It's easy for us to say that if we're healed of of being deaf and mute. It's harder when we're in difficult circumstances. God gives good gifts. In fact, every good gift is from God. That's a strong statement, isn't it? Every good act of giving and every perfect gift is from above. Surely, you say, I've gotten some good Christmas gifts. And God's name wasn't written on the tag. My spouse gave it to me. My parents gave it to me. A loved one gave it to me. Every good gift comes from God, though. Yes, even when God uses others to give those things to us. When he uses someone to bring the word of God to us, when he uses someone to bring good physical gifts to us, when he provides for us through through all kinds of different means, God is the provider of all good gifts, every single one of them. It's important to remember that. All good gifts, and only good gifts, come from God. And he says, if you're not quite sure about that, there's a couple of reasons why we can be sure. Because they come from the Father of the lights who does not change or shift like a shadow. Think of the person who gives you good gifts in this life. Do they always? Are they always giving? Are they always helping? Do they always do exactly what is best for you? At the right time? No, we fail one another because we change. Sometimes we don't feel so helpful. Sometimes we're a little too tired. Sometimes we just can't come up with anything to do or say that helps our neighbor. Maybe just because we don't want to. We change. But God doesn't. That's why he includes that here. You might say, why does he include that God doesn't change at this particular place 
Because if God says, I'm going to, the giver of good gifts to you, and then he says, and I never change, then we know that he will always give us what is best. And we can be sure that God is the giver of good gifts because God's gifts are gifts of grace. Yes, even parents who buy presents for their children, children who sometimes aren't very obedient or helpful, can sometimes give a picture of grace. No, parents, you shouldn't make your children earn their Christmas presents and their birthday presents. But nevertheless, there's still a relationship there, right? Because there's a relationship, because there is love shown, oftentimes that's reflected in the gifts. Husbands and wives love one another unconditionally, and yet, of course, we can't do that perfectly. What husband or wife married their spouse before their spouse had ever done or said or shown any inclination of love for them. That's not how it works, is it? It goes back and forth. But God, according to his plan, just as he planned, he gave us birth by the word of truth, he says. In other words, it was his decision, it was his plan to give us good gifts. It was his plan to love us. And if God doesn't change, he's going to keep that gracious plan all the time, even if we aren't perfect, because we aren't. How doubts can creep into our mind when we, start, when we forget the grace of God. When we think that God is a giver of good gifts, but maybe if I haven't been quite so good today, then he won't give me good gifts. We fall into that that uh, idea of, I call it Christian karma. Karma, bad things happen to bad people, good things happen to good people. Well, God blesses us, but he blesses us a little more for good. And maybe he throws a couple rotten eggs our way if we've been bad. No, God makes a plan, a plan to love us and bless us. And he doesn't change. He is gracious every day. For eternity. Of course, we can see those good and gracious gifts of God most clearly in the person of Jesus Christ. He's the greatest gift of all. God come from God into this world, into our flesh, to take on our humanity that he could take on our sin. Every good and perfect gift, and of course, the most perfect gift is from God, for us. And that doesn't change either. And that's by grace as well. Not because we've earned Jesus, not because we deserve a Savior, not because we've shown an inclination that maybe he should love us and save us. But just as he planned, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would be a first fruits of his creation. You see, that's how we receive the gifts of God, especially his good promised gifts. We receive them through the word of truth. The word of God is what he uses to bless us. That's what he uses to pour out all of his spiritual blessings to us. How easy it is for us to become focused on on the material blessings of this world. And indeed, the material blessings are good and they're fine. But when we start putting our hope and our trust in those material blessings, when we start thinking, God's love for me is going to show itself when he gives me X, Y, and Z. These things I can see, that I can hold, that I can stick in a bank account, that I can can, can, uh, find comfort from in this life then we are misreading the word of the Lord because nowhere in the word of God does he tell me how much money I'm going to have or what physical comforts I'll have. Indeed, many a Christian has had none of those things. But what he does promise, what I know that he will give to me, are his spiritual blessings, the ones that are found in his word. Because once again, we have the word of God that doesn't change. 
The word of God that's the same, when we go back to it, there it is again. And at the heart of it is the forgiveness of sins won for us by Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because God pours out his blessings to us in his word, it's important that we hear it. It's important that we listen to the word of, word of God because it is that word alone that gives birth to spiritual life. That language that James uses here is interesting. If you, if you backtrack a couple of verses before our text, we have the very same word. And it's a familiar passage as well. It talks about temptation. And he says, Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. We see what we are able to produce. We're able to produce sin. We're able to produce nothing but death. But according to the plan of God, he gives birth in us through his word, life. Spiritual life. Eternal life. That comes... Through the word of truth, the word of God. It is so easy for us to think of God's word as, as icing on the cake. As something that we can go back to that's special, like a treat. But the word of God is, it, it's like breathing. It's not something we do once in a while as a treat. It's something we need all the time. The word of God gives us life, the life that we need, the life that matters, the life that lasts. It alone is able to save your souls, James writes. It's able to save your souls. Because without it, all we have is sin that gives birth to death. We need salvation. And we find it in the word of God. A word that reveals the righteousness of God to us. That reveals to us all that he's done for us. And makes it our own through faith in Jesus Christ. Not only is it important that we hear the word of God, though. James emphasizes that it's important how we hear the word of God. Remember this, my dear brothers. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Now, we could just listen, look, think of that as good advice for life in this world, and indeed, I think it is. In conversations, at work, listen, think. Listen to what others have to say, and then speak. But that applies also to the Word of God. Verse 21 says, So after getting rid of all moral filthiness and overflowing wickedness, receive with humility the word planted in you that is able to save your souls. See, he, he draws a connection between this idea of, of listening. It's, a, it's an act of humility, isn't it? When you listen, you're saying, what you have to say is more important than what I have to say right now. And let's be honest, we don't always think that, do we? We listen to other people with the idea of, well... Yeah, I'm going to just, you know, bide my time here, but I've got something to say back to you that's more important than what you're saying right now. But don't we sometimes do that with the Word of God, too? Yeah, Lord, I'm, I'll read your Word, Lord. I'm, I'm listening to what you have to say, but, but, but really what I'm really concerned about is this or that problem. Lord, what do you have to tell me about that? Answer this question and that one. Make no mistake, there's nothing wrong with asking questions of the Word of God. Seeking out answers to our tough questions from God's Word. But when God's Word becomes a, a, a tool that we seek to bend and twist to find the answers to our questions, rather than letting God simply speak and say what He has to say, then we can easily twist around the words of the Lord to our own making to our own thoughts, to our own will. It's one of the beauties of what we call the lectionary, a set of readings that we go through, the one we use last three years. 
And as we go through those readings, we, we see God's word in bits and pieces. It would be easy for us to say, hey, let's just let's have a Sunday where we talk about this, that, or the other thing. And we can do that from time to time. We do. Right? Have Sundays about stewardship or mission work or, or something like that. But see, when you just take selections from the word of God, read your way through a gospel or through an epistle, you see all that God has to say. And you just stop and you sit back and you say, God, what do you have to say to me today? What good and perfect gift do you have for me in your word today? And then we humbly listen, as God wants us to, in humility. In humility, listen, receive the word that is planted in you. You need to hear the word of the Lord because it's God's means for giving. But as I said, James talks a lot about what we are supposed to do, right? Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Don't just listen to the word. Do what it says. But you see, God doesn't leave us powerless to do that. Rather, the word of God is our power for doing. Because you see, hearing the word of the Lord is a means, not an end in and of itself. Just as being here in church is not the end in and of itself. God's not keeping a tally of how many times you've been in church or, or checking you off. We don't hand over our friendship registers to God and say, all right, God, here's the ones that you, you need to bless this week. They've been in church. Being in church is about hearing the word and receiving that power from God. It's power for something. Because God wants to accomplish something. It's a means, not an end in and of itself. Of course, we recognize the greater end that God has and wants for all of us is eternal salvation. But he has a lot of goals along the way as well. And one of those things that he wants from us in hearing the word is to not just hear it, but to do what it says. To do the word. To, to carry out his will. That when it tells us to do something, that that's what we then do. It isn't just up to our power to do that. The very word that commands us also gives us the gospel motivation to do it. Because we are free. We are free to serve God. That is an interesting statement that James makes. It says, but the one who looks carefully into the perfect law, the law, that, the law of freedom. The law of freedom. We think of laws as, as the opposite of freedom. They bind us. They tell us what we've got to do. I'm not free. I've got to do this. But when we see the word of God, we take it as a whole. And there we find laws that tell us what to do. But we also find that every time we sin... Every sin we've committed, every last failure, even right down to the thoughts and the inklings of our heart, has been paid for by Jesus Christ. We're forgiven. And so as you go about your day and you see your failures from yesterday, we aren't bound in fear to say, well, I've got to fix it or else God won't love me. Instead we say, praise the Lord. He's forgiven my sins. Now how can I serve you? Let me try again today to do what you've commanded. Let me try again today to curb my anger, to listen patiently, to love my neighbor, to do whatever it is that God has told me in his law to do. Because in God's law, he tells us something about ourselves. He says, this is what you are. Yeah, you were, you were sinful to the core, only knowing how to commit sin. But then I made you the first fruits of my creation. You have my power. You are alive in the Spirit. Don't forget it. Don't forget what you are. Don't be like someone, he says, who, who looks in the mirror and then walks away and immediately forgets who he is. The word of the Lord tells you what you are. 
Of course, it tells us who God is, but it tells you who you are. You are his, royal, his holy priesthood, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. You've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified. You've been made children of God. His glorious church, a temple that glorifies God. Don't forget it. His word is the power for you to do it, to be what he says you are. It says religion that is pure and undefiled in the sight of God the Father is this, to take care of orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Our world gives religion a bad rap. It, it will say, many people will say, well, God is good, faith is good, spirituality is good, but religion, religion is bad. And I think what they mean is this, religion is really putting doctrine into practice. The way that we live and we work and we serve as Christians, that's our religion. It, it involves sitting in church, and it involves the way in which we worship, but it also involves the way in which we live our lives in the world. If we go about our lives saying, I've been in church, it doesn't matter what I do out there, that, out there then our religion is worthless. It's pointless. If we say, I've listened to the word, I haven't changed, but I've listened, that's all that matters, then we've taken hearing the word of God to be the goal in and of itself. James says, religion that is pure and undefiled in the sight of God is this, to take care of orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. It's two things. It's, positively speaking, love. Especially those who need it, especially those who are helpless, especially those who are most vulnerable. Love them. Help them. Serve them. Serve all those around you who need your help. But then also, on the negative side, remain undefiled by the world. Keep yourself from sin. Keep yourself from the world which wants to pull you away. Don't say, I can commit whatever sins I want because I've loved my neighbor. Both of them go hand in hand, right? We love our neighbor, but we also want to keep ourselves from sin. This is religion that is pure and undefiled in the sight of God. Ultimately, if we listen to the word of God once in a while, it can be a blessing to us. But how easily will we forget it? As long as we're sinners, we forget pretty quickly, pretty easily. Just like walking away from that mirror and forgetting who we are, what we are, what we look like. But when we continually hear the word of the Lord, then we continually are blessed spiritually through that word. That we would have the power of God to obey his commands, to serve him, and to be a blessing to our neighbor as well. Hear the word of the Lord. It is God's good gift to you. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join, uh, we join to sing the Create in Me.
Father in heaven, bless this offering which we bring, prospering its work in your kingdom to provide the gospel to others. May it be followed by our regular gifts, each generously and cheerfully given. Let the example of Christ's sacrifice on our behalf teach us the unselfish love and humble service required to bring salvation to others. In his name we ask this. Amen. In our prayers this evening, we pray for the family of Muriel Douglas, who was called to eternal glory on Tuesday evening. Her funeral will be here at St. John's on Saturday morning at 11. Let us pray. Lord of heaven and earth, we give thanks for all your goodness and your mercy. Grant us faith in your power that we may always trust you for our daily needs and fulfill our duties without fear and anxiety for tomorrow knowing that you care for all your children and that you give perfect gifts to all of us. Open our minds to understand that our most precious treasure is the unsearchable riches of Christ, that our most satisfying food is the bread of life, and that our most glorious dress is your righteousness which you clothe us with. Endow your church and your people with a spirit of humility and sympathy that the compassion of Christ may shine forth in love and kindness toward the fallen, the wayward, and the heavy laden. Strengthen your servants everywhere that they may not grow weary in doing good. Though all of life's short day, through all of life's short day, help our families with your divine blessing and presence. Be with them in sorrow or joy, sickness or health, disappointment or success, and preserve them with your grace. O Lord God, Lord of life and death, we thank you for all the mercies with which you blessed our fellow believer, Muriel Douglas, now fallen asleep. We thank you especially for having brought her to the knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would comfort her family and all who mourn her death with your precious promises and cheer them with the sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Grant the lifeless body rest and at last, together with us all, a joyful resurrection to life everlasting. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain hearts of wisdom and finally be saved through Jesus Christ, our risen and ever-living Lord. Forgive our sins, O Lord, and teach us that you are a God of grace and mercy. And since we can do no good thing without your help, renew us daily by your Spirit, that we may bring forth the works of faith, hope, and love, and finally reap with all of your saints the abundant joy of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock till he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Thanks to the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this Holy Supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Good evening to you once again. I pray that God blesses us, that his word, which we have heard, would fill us with his power, that his good gifts would be poured out to us. Take note of the announcements that are in your bulletin. A couple of additional ones. You'll see the, uh, a yellow canary-colored sheet in your bulletin. That was kind of a late addition to the, to the bulletin. Um, there have been some, announce- some things in there about uh, our electronic giving. Um, if you use that, if you use the electronic giving, the, the website on our website has changed, and the app, if you use the phone app, that's changed too. There's some more detailed instructions on here how to, how to get things rolled over. Things should roll over if you already have gifts that are set to give. They should roll over to the new app. But if you want to make any changes, you have to use the new uh, information there to get things changed. So uh, just take note of those, especially if you use electronic giving or if you're thinking about it. Um, next Sunday, and there's an announcement in there about this, uh, next Sunday is Wells National Hymn Week, and we are going to be having a special service which uses a, uh, 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 an order of service from the new hymnal. And just today, uh, we received, uh, the Synod sent out two hymnals and one Psalter to every congregation that we can look at. So, if you are interested in looking at the hymnal, the table in the back and the in the uh, narthex, we've got a couple of hymnals sitting there if you want to look at that, see what it looks like, see, see what's in there, see if your favorite hymn's in there, I guess. It's probably the first thing we want to look at and see. Uh, but we'll get a taste of a couple of new hymns and one of the liturgies next Sunday. And in between services, we'll have a, uh, a hymn sing, singing a bunch of new hymns. Um, it'll be on video. There's uh, choirs from Martin Luther College and Luther Prep and we have a grade school choir as well that will be leading that. So we'll, instead of Bible class, we'll gather in here and we'll sing some hymns and learn some new hymns hopefully as well. And uh, see what a great blessing I believe this hymnal will be for our congregation and for our synod as well. May God be with you till we come to his house to worship him again. <laughs> 